see all of you here. Actually, this is a very large crowd for a Friday morning. We have as our first speaker, Joshua Parker. I've seen him uh, several times at conferences. He's a brilliant young man. He got out of college about 15 years ago, and he has a degree in, of all things, geology from the University of Oregon. He started studying Tesla about the time he was finishing up college, and this led him into Royal Rife, which is a substantial body of study of its own. He comes from a medical family. His father is a doctor. His sister is a noted naturopath, Rebecca Parker in Bellingham. And so he's just really following some natural lines of study here. And his equipment looks really intriguing. And I hear it works very well. So let's welcome Joshua Parker. Thanks, Michael, and thanks to everyone for having me here and for getting here so early. I have some really important information or interesting information to share with you all about RIFE today. And, uh, you know, as Michael was saying, I, I got into this from studying Tesla and kind of grew up at events like this, and, and th this has been an inspiration for me. So, uh, it, and it led me to, uh, naturally to Rife's technology and as I as I learned more about it of course it, I found a natural uh, progression into studying al other alternative cancer therapies and and uh, and so decrypting Rife's extraordinary technology uh, that the, that's the name of the presentation that I'm giving today and so why decrypting Decrypting because really what I'm going to share today is that Rife's technology was actually encoded into basically an algorithm that was essentially hidden from even Rife himself. And it's kind of a strange phenomenon, but Rife, Rife was an optical engineer. He wasn't an electrical engineer. And he, he did some work in electronics, but Primarily, he worked with other individuals that helped him out with his electronic building. And so I'll, I'll get into that. Uh, first, quick disclaimer, I'm not a medical doctor. As Michael said, I have a degree in geology, of all things. Uh, that kind of, as I was finishing that, I, it got me into studying Tesla and health stuff and kind of led me in a unique direction. But. Uh, so I'm not a medical doctor, and I can't make any medical claims. If you have a health condition, I recommend you see a doctor. Uh, and that's enough of that. Also, I, I want to acknowledge all the individuals researching Rife out there, especially my friend Jeff Garf, who has done all, all the spectrum analysis work that I'm going to be sharing with you of an original 1938 beam ray machine. So. What I'll be covering today is some of the, first, some of the history of Rife and the different instruments uh, and how they work. The, also a lot about the frequencies and, and the origin of the audio frequencies and what I call the Rife code. So Rife was born uh, May 18th. 1888, died August 5th, 1971. Uh, he was a, a, obviously a genius engineer, primarily an optical engineer. He developed optical instruments that, in, in a number of different fields and did some amazing things which, oh, we're getting an overlap here. I don't know why that is. Uh, <laughs> that wasn't on the original PowerPoint, but, uh, so, so he worked with Carl Zeiss and eventually established himself in San Diego. Uh, and he, he designed an X-ray optical instrument which saved uh, Henry Timken of the, uh, looks like these, aren't, these are gonna overlap. So he saved Hen Henry Timken millions of dollars annually in quality control with his ball bearing manufacturing with this x-ray uh, device that, that uh, helped him cut out the losses. So uh, with this, Henry Timken 
basically gifted him a million dollar, multi-million dollar laboratory and plenty of, of funding to uh, continue his research. And he built all, all his optical instruments in that, in his, his own machine shop. And, and so that's how he let, that's how he was able to develop the, uh, the optical microscope called the universal microscope, which is kind of a, a famous thing at this point. Uh, so he, what, it, what the microscope was that was unique was it, it was a, it, w it was using monochromatic light. So he was isolating specific wavelengths of light and, and using quartz prisms to do that. And, and so it was a unique way of illuminating the organisms. And so instead of staining the organisms with uh, a chemical stain that would kill them, he was able to keep them in a living state and, and illuminate them and essentially stain them with, uh, with wavelengths, specific wavelengths of light that would match the actual organism. So he would use different wavelengths for different organisms. And, and he, uh, he, he was a, a pleomorphist as far as his, uh, his views go. So he believed and, and saw that he could culture different forms of organisms basic, based on the, the growing medium. So uh, I, I personally believe that kind of ties into a lot of the, uh, the more modern research on bioterrain and the importance of, of, of the terrain of our body. So, uh, you know, he was, he was developing these frequency instruments that, that people know about today, but he was, he was a pleomorphist and so he, he understood the importance of, of the medium. And, and so he, he understood and figured out from, from using his microscope that each species of organism, of microorganism, had a specific vibratory rate. And, and so with this, he was able to take his, his, uh, his microscopes in a, uh, in a, in a direction and, and surpass other microscopes of that era, like the electron microscope. So, uh, so his hypothesis was that he could potentially resonate uh, the microorganisms at their, at their specific vibration rate. Uh, but it, I'll, I'll get into why it's not, it wasn't so simple as just resonating them. The, there was more to the technology than just hitting that resonance and entraining the organism. So he, he started with lower frequencies, with audio frequencies in his original experiment, experimentation in the 20s. And then he moved up into radio, radio frequencies. So he was basically starting lower and moving up to see what, what worked and, and looking at the results in his microscope. And so the, uh, the radio frequency is where he really start, started to see the response and, and see the die off under the microscope. And, he, he called these vibration rates the MOR, mortal oscillatory rate. And, and so Reif's original MORs were in the radio frequency range. And so we know that from, from lab notes that were, that were left. Now, a lot of lab notes were lost because there was a, there was a strategic effort to, uh, to destroy his work. And there's been a lot of reporting on that, so I'm not going to get too into that. Uh, but the, uh, the bottom line is that he he was he was using radio frequency. We do have some lab notes. There's some inconsistencies in some of those lab notes. Uh, so, but but you know we, we we do have some some record of this. And 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 so basically. What Reif was doing is he was using a radio frequency and he was pulsing it with a lower audio frequency. And, and so this was, this combination of a, a high frequency and a low frequency is, it, it, it was a standard thing. It, it, it's used in radio and has been since long before Reif was, was doing it. And, 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 but that was the method and, and that's what seemed to work. So. So that's, that's what he was doing. He was, and, but the important part there is that he was only using the audio frequencies to pulse the radio frequencies. And, and so, 
Philip Hoyland was Rife's engineer in the 1930s, his, his electrical engineer. Philip Hoyland, as I'll explain, was the, the engineer that built all the original machines in the 1930s. So, uh, so him, both him and Rife used audio frequencies to pulse the signal, but Hoyland actually used them in a little bit different way. Uh, but the, the, uh, the way that Hoyland used them and the, the instrument that Hoyland produced, the beam ray instrument from 1938, is really the kind of the, the, the most misunderstood instrument out there. And so that's why I'm going to show you some spectrum analysis of a re recovered 1938 beam ray machine that is the only one known in existence uh, and it, it's helped really take this understanding to the next level. So, Rife used, as I said, Rife used audio to pulse the, uh, the radio frequency. Uh, but the, the important thing about the way Philip Hoyland did that was that he used a specific radio frequency to trigger sidebands, basically sideband harmonics that would, that that would have a cascade of, of these sideband frequencies. And it was those sideband frequencies that were actually very important as far as working, as far as the machines working. So without those sidebands, you have, uh, you have a carrier and, and that's not necessarily the actual working MOR frequency. So that, that's what that's what the, the point of uh, the spectrum analysis work was because we, from the history, we have these lists of audio frequencies and we have these radio frequencies from the lab notes and there's never been any correlation between them and, and no one's really, up until very recently, been able to really understand the mathematical relationship between the two. And, and it's, it's really an important factor as far as duplicating the technology. So, uh, and any of this, I, I, will, I will answer questions uh, at, at, my, at my table if, uh, if we can't get to them at the end. So, so and the, the other thing that a lot of, there's a lot of confusion about is sine versus square and what type of waves Rife was using in the 1930s. Well, in the 1930s, the technology of that era was, was all vacuum tubes and there was no sign, I mean, there was no square waves. It was all sine waves. But the, the way the plasma tube, which is, which is broadcasting uh, the ray tube or the plasma tube, he usually called it the ray tube. Uh, a lot of times they're called plasma tubes now. The way those, those ray tubes were working, they were actually essentially creating a square wave. And, and so if you look at the, at the, at the waveform of after it goes through a plasma tube or a ray tube, then you can, you can actually see that, that uh, and, and here's, here's that waveform on the bottom. You can see uh, on the top, you have a standard sine wave and the, the radio oscillators of the 1930s actually produced very clean sine waves uh, like that. And, but once you put it through a ray tube, you end up with something like that, what's on, what's on the slide below. So we have, uh, we have square waves, but they were, they were basically generated by sine waves. And the, actually the, the waveform gets a bit more complex than that when you, when you really uh, dig into the, the way that they were pulsed because the, the pulse was a really important factor. And the, the other thing that was really important was the, the, the actual plasma tube. I mean, these, all the original instruments were broadcasting through this ray tube or this plasma tube. And this was bringing on that, that plasma state, the, the fourth state of matter. We have solid, liquid, gas, and plasma. And this plasma state seems to be an important factor um, as far as you, the, the way of using a compact antenna that can handle a lot of power, uh, but it also brings on that plasma state. So it, essentially, it's, it's 
in a way, filling the whole room with this energy. Now, that doesn't negate the factor of, of the, the power level falls off with the square of the distance. So Reif used all, all these original instruments in close proximity to the, the subject. And, and, and that's something that kind of has diverged in, in some of the modern equipment. So I, I think it's, a, it's an important factor. We don't necessarily need just to boost power levels higher and higher in order to achieve the effects if we're getting the right frequency. And if we're not getting the right frequency, we can continue to boost the power level higher and higher, and we're not necessarily going to get the effect. We might get a different effect, but we're, we're not necessarily going to get the same effect. So, so uh, that's more about harmonics. Phil Poyland used audio frequencies to, to, to basically hide these working frequencies. And the reason was is he, he was the one that was paid to, to, he was the one that was paid originally by Rife to, to identify the working frequencies in the original equipment. The original equipment was actually, was actually standard frequency generators of the era. It was made by a company called Colin B. Kennedy. Uh, they, they made high quality frequency generators uh, used for testing and radio technology. And, uh, and, and, and so that, that's the impulse wave that's essentially generated by, uh, that's essentially generated by pulsing the audio frequency pulsing the radio frequencies with an audio frequency. But so, uh, so Hoyland was, basically that's, uh, I'm just explaining, I, I already explained all this stuff. Um, the importance of voltage spikes, seem, that seems to be an important factor, and especially when, when uh, understanding how these frequencies were broadcast through these, the, these plasma tubes. The, uh, the original systems that were used with the, the Colin B. Kennedy equipment, they were pulsed in a way that, it, and, and essentially the only custom equipment that was used in the original testing in 1934 was was a, a custom-made amplifier, which was connected to the, the plasma tube. So that was essentially the broadcaster. And that was, that's, that's how the, the frequencies were actually delivered to the patient. The, uh, the way that they were pulsed delivered a, a signal like this, an impulse wave, essentially. And I, in my other research, I've found this to be an important factor in a lot of technology. When you look at Tesla technology, there's a lot of areas where I impulse waves and pulsed signals are, are really important as far as duplicating the results. So I think that this is an important factor to, um, to keep in mind. So it basically, it's a, it ended up with a, a, a steep voltage spike on the leading edge of the waveform. And, and so, basically, the, the diagram, the spectrum analysis that you see here is, um, is this, the centerpiece of this is the, is the radio frequency carrier. And, and if you, you see all these peaks on the side, as they cascade down. Those are all the sidebands. And so the specific spacing between those sidebands was created by the specific audio frequency that was used. So, so it, it, it's basically what it means is that Hoyland could develop a machine where the, the, the center peak is not necessarily the actual frequency, the actual MOR. Uh, this thing's not quite staying on, but there we go. So this center frequency was not necessarily actually the, the MOR, the working frequency that was, that was actually triggering the death of the microorganism. This was, obviously this was the, the bottom line with Rife. Rife had a passion for, 
for helping people, and he he wanted to cure cancer. That's that was his drive, and he was doing. He was working on this diligently through the 20s and 30s, and and he had a great deal of success, especially in the 30s. And and the the way he did that was with perseverance and 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 he uh, he was using instruments the original instruments that Reif was using uh, were were not using sidebands uh, but the it's this unique this unique distribution of frequencies that I'm going to get into that 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 was so important when uh, when considering the instrument that that this man Philip Hoyland developed and and was sold by uh, Rife and Philip Hoyland's partnership, the Beam Rays Corporation. So as I said, Philip Hoyland was Rife's engineer. He was paid to, to read those frequencies. And, and, and he, was, he was the business side of, of the partnership. He was, Rife was a, as I said, he was, he was diligently trying to to help people, he he was not a businessman. He was he was uh, working with these technologies, which were largely public domain technologies, because these were standard radio oscillators of the era. So there wasn't really so much unique in the actual instruments that were used, but it was the way that they were using frequencies that were that was unique. So, uh, so essentially, Hoyland was coming into this and built, originally he was built, paid to build these machines for Rife, and, and then they got into a business partnership where he was then the, the side of things that was trying to make it a viable business. So how do you protect a, a public domain technology like this when you have something so unique and potentially you're gonna have doctors wanting to order uh, these buy these machines from you, and uh, and so so he, he had limited options as far as patent protection, and his method seemed to have been to keep the frequencies proprietary. So and 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 so this this slide right here shows a. Uh, this, show, this is one example of, of the uh, E. coli or B. coli or E. coli rod form. And, and you can see here, we've got a, a, a main carrier frequency of, of 3.8 megahertz. And, and the actual MOR frequency that Hoyland targeted was a little bit lower than that. So the way he did that was using a specific audio frequency that would offset the, that primary carrier frequency and, and trigger these side, side bands, which then led to this specific one being there. And so the operator of the machine didn't know which one was actually working, and, and there, were, there, was, there were no spectrum analyzers. So this was pretty easy to keep hidden in that era. So, so Hoyland essentially figured out how to hide the frequencies, and and he did that really to protect the technology and in order to uh, to make a viable business out of it. So th this is the original beam ray instrument from from 1938 that was recovered recently in the last couple of years, and and a lot has been learned about this technology because of the because of this, this machine being recovered and, and brought back into working order. As you can see, it's, uh, it's, it's lighting this tube right here and, and broadcasting frequencies. So, uh, so, so that, and as I said, that was a, that was a production, uh, that was a partnership between Reif and Hoyland. Uh, this was the first and only compact production model that they built. And so it was designed to be manufactured. The other machines were much larger, as you'll see in a minute. So let's take a, we'll, we'll take a closer look at that machine, but first I'm gonna cover some of the other machines that were used. 
as I said, these were off-the-shelf frequency generators. This is, this is the uh, 1934 clinic from USC. And as you can see, it's, a, it's a, essentially a whole table full of, of equipment because these were standard off-the-shelf frequency generators aside from the, the one amplifier which was broadcasting the frequencies through the plasma tube. So, so and, and here you can, you can see uh, even more detail of, of all these Kennedy, all this Kennedy equipment that was in Rife's lab. So Rife was, was tuning these, ins, these machines and watching the results in his microscope. And that's how he was able to figure out what frequencies were working and, and, and what ones weren't. And, and, and then he, he paid Hoyland to then take that to the next level and understand what it, more than, because Rife was actually just dialing, the, the moving the knobs and dialing in frequencies with the, these radio oscillators. And then Hoyland was the one that was supposed to take the, the, the readings, the number calibrated readings uh, that were uh, from the dials and, and actually read them on an oscilloscope. As, as I said, there, there wasn't really any, anything like a spectrum analyzer back then, but they did have, have some basic oscilloscopes and, and the reading of those instruments, or of those uh, frequencies was done by Hoyland, as I said. So, and, and this, this is an advertisement for the Colin B. Kennedy. This, is, this was a popular technology, popular instruments of that era. And, and really arguably the best equipment. Some of this equipment you can find today and it still works. Uh, so it, it's, uh, as you can see, this is, this is a picture, color picture of one of these, one of these oscillators and, and it still works. So, so he, he was using a custom amplifier though. And, and as I said, that plasma tube or that ray tube was an important part of actually bringing on that, that triggering those cascades of, of sidebands because without that, that ray tube, it, it didn't actually create that. The, 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 uh, the, the oscillating circuit just wasn't there to create that without the, the, re the plasma tube resonating. So these days we see a lot of, of more modern instruments that, that don't use a plasma tube and a lot of these instruments are, are are quite good instruments. They they do some very unique things, uh, but without the plasma tube, it's it's not exactly like what what Rife was doing, and and of course that doesn't even get into the factor of whether the frequencies are right. Uh, so uh, so this this machine was an important machine. This is referred to as the Rife Ray Number Four. This is uh, this was really the first machine that that Hoyland built that had all the, that had everything in one box essentially. And, and it was, but it was a large machine. It was never designed to be a production model. It, it was a floor standing machine with very large coils and, and it, it, again, it did broadcast the frequencies through a ray tube or through a plasma tube. But it, it, uh, it was, as I said, it was never designed for a production model. And the, the thing to understand about this machine is that it, it worked on, with Rife's original lab note frequencies. So it, it, was, it was not using the sideband method that I described of Philip Hoyland. So, um, so it, was a, it was a large and heavy unit. Uh, th this, this is the beam ray clinical instrument which is essentially, this was the machine that, that Hoyland had worked on for a couple years, a few years, and, and with the intention of, of making a, a system that was smaller, but could still hit on all the important frequencies to, to make it work. So, um, so he, he did quite an interest, interesting project with this machine because obviously if, if this is the case, then he, has deceived a whole, you know, generations of, of Rife researchers as far as how these frequencies were actually working and or how this machine was actually generating the working frequencies. So this, it, it was stated by Rife that 
it worked on a different principle. And this came out in the beam rays trial in, in 1939. So uh, the, obviously the, the partnership between Philip Hoyland and, and Royal Rife dissolved into a, uh, a legal battle in 1939. Uh, so it, it, was, it was pretty brutal. And, and, and the unfortunate part about that is that that's where the technology was lost. Because if, if you think about it, if, if, if Philip Hoyland designed this machine, which was hiding all these original frequencies, and, and then shortly thereafter, literally like a year later after the release of this machine, a, a legal battle came about which, which destroyed the company, then he might have been doing everything he could to prevent the information from coming out about how the machine actually worked. And, and only a handful of them were ever sold. So that's, that's why it, it's so important that, that this one recently was, was uncovered. So, so what, what made this machine so unique? As I said, the, uh, it, it has to do with the, the waveform and the way the, the, the cascading sidebands were produced with that plasma tube. The, uh, this machine was, was really what solidified the reputation of Rife. So uh, even though it was only produced for a short period of time, those machines were out there and they were used by some of the famous doctors that, that are known in, in Rife circles historically that were using them in the 40s and 50s. And, and so this, this was a very important machine, and, and they were all built by Philip Hoyland. So, so, uh, so, th so essentially, they, they started the legacy of, of Rife. And, and so w one of the things that I think we should ask is then if, if this is the machine that started the legacy of Rife, then why haven't the machines continued to improve over the years? And instead, they seem to decline in the 40s and 50s and ne really never work quite as well. So, so and, and this, this is a machine that there's not as much information about. This is the, the beam ray laboratory machine. It was an even more complex instrument. Um, it, it may have worked on... Uh, on a, well, it worked on a different principle. Uh, it, it may have been a machine that was heterodyning multiple radio frequencies. Uh, that's, that's definitely a, uh, a possibility. Uh, but there's very little information about it. But it was used in the laboratory and it was used to identify working frequencies and, and it, in order to figure out what was, what was working with the microscopes. So it was generally used in, in close proximity to a universal microscope in, in order to uh, identify the working machines or the working frequencies. Um, so again, it was only for experimental use. It was not a production model. Now, this is an interesting mach machine. And this, this instrument was, uh, w this, is the, uh, this is the Aubrey Schoon beam ray replica from the 1940s. And the reason that this is such an interesting machine, and, and it actually discovering the 1938 beam ray machine helped decipher how this machine was actually working. Because it, it, was, it was unique in that it was using a different radio frequency carrier wave. But it actually was working on the same principles as, as the uh, the Philip Hoyland, the other, the previous Philip Hoyland machine, it was just tuned differently, and that gets into the uh, the importance of the tuning of of that machine and why this was such an interesting method for Philip Hoyland to develop, because he could he could simply change the the carrier wave, and then all of a sudden all of the audio frequencies would have to be changed, so. The, and the, and the, the cool thing about this machine historically is that it, it came with, or it still had, a list of the audio frequencies. So once, once those were, uh, once, once we could correlate 
the spectrum analysis work from the beam ray clinical machine from 1938, then the spectrum analysis of this machine and, and, and the correlation, the mathematics between this, this radio frequency carrier, which was a little bit lower, made a lot more sense. And, and it can, you can actually see that, and, and uh, I have a report that fully documents all this stuff at, at my table if anyone's interested in really taking this to the very technical level. Uh, but the bottom line is that the mathematics worked when you look at, at this machine as well as the beam ray machine. Even though this machine had a 3.3 megahertz carrier wave and the beam ray machine had a 3.8 megahertz carrier wave. So, So, it, so in other words, it was, it was very similar to the beam ray clinical machine. Now this is the, the AZ-58, and all the machines, as I was saying, all these machines were all using a plasma tube, including this machine, the AZ-58. So uh, in the early days, there was always a ray tube or a plasma tube used as the broadcasting element or the, the antenna. So, the AZ-58 was, a, uh, a, was a, a unique instrument that came later in the 50s. And, and the reason I say it was a unique instrument is because essentially it should have used the same principle. But what, what happened, and, and the reason that, that we believe that this machine never worked as well, is because it never had a correlation between the radio frequency and the audio frequency. Essentially, it was using the same audio frequencies, but was using a higher frequency radio, radio frequency carrier. So the mathematics didn't line up, and therefore the sidebands weren't cascading in the, in the correct way, and, and therefore the audio frequencies weren't triggering the radio frequency that, that needed to, to hit that microorganism. And, and for that reason, they, they just didn't work as well. And, and they, they, they really, they could have if they were properly tuned by Philip Hoyland, but Philip Hoyland wasn't around in that era, so that, that didn't happen. So, so, so in other words, they, they were working for some things, but when it came to complex diseases such as cancer, they, uh, they, they, weren't, they weren't doing the job. And, and, and so this is, this is clear from, from the history. Now, uh, this is one of the first machines that, that uh, was used historically that, that had no plasma tube or ray tube a, as the broadcaster. So this was a, a, a big deviation in the technology. But in addition to not having the plasma tube, this was also just using straight audio frequencies. The, uh, the carrier wave was completely eliminated. And the reason that I think that the carrier wave was eliminated was because John Crane may not have really properly understood that, that, that mathematics and the fundamental relationship between the radio frequency and the audio frequency. And therefore, when he, when he designed this machine, and, and uh, he also was clearly on a budget with this machine. I mean, this is just a basic audio frequency generator of that era modified slightly with some, with some metal electrodes that were used to con conduct the signal to the skin. So it was a very different method of, of, of actually absorbing those frequencies and clearly wasn't doing the same thing as the, the, that, those cascading sidebands that the plasma tube was, was generating. So, uh, so, so the, this was the first machine where the radio frequency was eliminated. Uh, so, and, and it's an interesting factor because it, it was also using a, a very simple square wave. And it really started a generation or a couple generations of, of instruments much like this, which, which we still have today. And they're, they're instruments that are very helpful for a lot of things. So that it's not that they're, they're bad instruments, but when we look at these things, we have to understand that they're working on a different principle than the original instruments from the 1930s that really gave Royal Rife his name. So 
we, we need to understand how, and we're understanding more and more these days about how these audio frequencies are actually working, and it's more likely that they're triggering different, different responses in the body and, and, and enabling the body to help heal itself in, in different ways versus Rife's original technology was, was designed to zap the bugs, essentially, to, uh, to use this radio frequency to kill off microorganisms, pathogenic microorganisms. So, so it, it was a, it's a different method. So, and as, as far as using the, as far as using audio frequencies, there does seem to be some limitations on uh, as far as killing pathogenic microbes. So, so I kind of covered all that. Uh, so they were not pulsed radio frequencies. So, and you know, I'll get in, I'll go through this pretty quick. Uh, if you if you're looking at modern instruments and you want to understand what you're looking at. Uh, you want to understand the frequency range. If the frequency range is limited to, to like up to 20,000 hertz, then it's, it's one of these more modern audio frequency generators, uh, which, as I said, can be interesting and helpful for a lot of things, but it wasn't using Rife's original method. And if it's a radio frequency instrument, um, ideally, based on the spe original spectrum analysis, we want a, fre a carrier frequency in the three megahertz range. And that's just, it's a, it's a mathematical relationship. It just has to do with, with triggering all the, the particular sidebands that were working MOR frequencies. So, you know, we can, we can go up to higher radio frequencies, but then it just gets harder to hit the, the, correct, the correct frequencies as far as the correct MORs. And we, we have a limit in this cascade of frequencies, we have a limit of how far we can go and still be effective. So if, if, our, if the sideband we're looking at is like the 50th or 100th sideband, it's not going to work as well as if it's the 6th or 7th or one of the, uh, the ones that's closer to the, the highest power, which is the radio frequency carrier. So, uh, so I've covered this. Uh, this was another another uh, instrument of, of John Crane, similar principle. He was on a budget to, to put this, this machine into production. It looks a little more like his own machine than the, than the previous one, but it was still inside. It was still just an audio frequency generator. So, and, and as I said, Rife's original laboratory was funded by Henry Timken. That, that was long past in the 50s and 60s when, when these machines were being used. So, so that's, that's likely why, uh, I mean, that's a lot, a lot of reasons why these machines weren't, weren't, uh, weren't working quite as well. So, so they lacked the crucial RF carrier. And, and, and the, the, new, the next generation of machines that we know of today that's, that's often called a quote-unquote Rife machine is based on, on this type of machine. So uh, that's an important thing to understand. Just because someone's out there selling a, a machine and calling it a Rife machine, first of all, that can get kind of uh, difficult for companies to do. Uh, but if they call it a Rife machine, it doesn't necessarily mean it's using the frequencies that Rife used in the 1930s. So. So now you can see how, how difficult it is to answer a question like, do Rife machines work? You know, I got into this and started sharing this kind of equipment with, with all kinds of people that were, that were around me, and, and I saw some very, very helpful things happen, very different things with different instruments, because I was using all different kinds of instruments. And, uh, and, and so, so it really depends on what the instrument is, what, what type of frequencies it's using, and, and also, of course, you know, what the, the health issue is that, that someone's going after. So, so, so if, if this was the, basically the quintessential 
rife machine, then, uh, then what's the secret, you know, and why, why didn't rife duplicate it in, in, in the later era after Hoyland was gone? Well, it, it worked on, on a different principle. Hoyland's only way to protect it, as I said, was hiding the frequencies. And so he figured out a way to do that. And, and so this is, this is what Hoyland said at the Beam Ray trial in 1939. He had, he had done all of the building and designing of the machines. So, uh, so Hoyland, Hoyland was the, the guy that was building all these. And, and essentially, what, it's kind of hard to see it, but what that quote says, and this is a quote of Royal Rife from the Beam Ray trial, is Royal Rife said that, that the frequencies, can, the, the wavelength, which is also frequency, um, we, we have a given wavelength, and it can be produced in different ways, but it, sh it should do the same thing no matter how it's, it's produced. So essentially what he was saying is that, that he, that Hoyland was, was doing things a little bit differently, but they were working, and, and that's, what, that's what was important. So, so Reif knew that the, that the instrument was, was working in a different way. Uh, so, so, but clearly there was some, there was some information that was likely not shared by Philip Hoyland during that trial. Uh, and, and he was a 51% partner in the, in the company. So uh, this didn't really put Reif in, in the best position. So, and, and as I said, he built all of, of the instruments. So, so why, why not patent an instrument? And, and, and this, is, this is, of course, another popular instrument of that era. There were lots of popular electrotherapy instruments in the era that Reif was, was working on this technology. And the Reif ray, or I mean the violet ray, was possibly the most popular electrotherapy machine ever. In its heyday, there were hundreds of companies making these, these machines. And they, they were, there were some patents, but they became public domain. And essentially, what, we, what you have with the violet ray is a, a plasma tube and a, a Tesla coil. So it was, it was not that much different than what Reif was doing. The big difference there was that Reif wasn't using a Tesla coil. Reif was using a tuned radio oscillator. And, and, but that was standard radio technology of that era. That was used by radio stations. It was used by ham radio folks. And, and, and so, so this was, that was clearly, uh, it, it was not something that he could really effectively patent. So, so that, as I explained, the big difference between the two, uh, Violet Ray was using a spark gap and a, a Tesla coil oscillator. Whereas the, uh, the, the tuned radio oscillator in, in, in Rife's was, uh, was, was very unique in that it, it could produce that, that cascade of sidebands, especially when it, was, when it was designed like Philip Hoyland's machine was. So, and uh, as I said, uh, Philip Hoyland was paid to identify those frequencies that were used in the uh, 1934 USC cancer trial. And, uh, and, and then he was designing the smaller units. I've already covered this. So, uh, so did these machines work? Well, this one did. It, it sure did. And also the machine from 1934, which as I showed was a, a whole table full of, of uh, different, different equipment from standard radio oscillators of that era. Um, and, and so it was working in, in that time period. So, so and, and there were a number of doctors using it as I was saying before. Um, so ha many, a lot of people and a lot of companies have tried to duplicate Rife's technology, uh, but really it was a difficult task, as I've shown you, with, with these essentially hidden sidebands, no one really was, was 
understanding how important that relationship was between the radio frequency and the audio frequency. Uh, so, so, and as far as audio frequency machines go, we had, or we've, we've seen a lot of, of development there. We have a lot of, of different instruments that are available these days, and, and, and there, there's a lot of great instruments out there. Uh, and these audio instruments are, uh, are, are they're, they're great instruments, they do interesting things, but they're definitely not, according to uh, this research, they're not working on the same principle as, as Rife. Um, and, and that also includes, it's kind of hard to see there, but uh, the, the, uh, the Rife Bear instruments and, and uh, James Bear, Dr. James Bear here in Albuquerque has done some, some great work to produce some, some instruments that are very easy to manufacture. And it, and it was a, a, a good step in the direction of getting back to using a plasma tube to broadcast those frequencies. So that's, that's an important instrument to, to understand and there's a lot of those instruments out there on the market. But it was using a, a different frequency range and they, they typically use a frequency range, a, a fixed radio frequency carrier about 27 megahertz because it's based on on using standard parts and, and slight modifications, and that was using a modified CB radio for the radio frequency carrier. And so without understanding those sidebands, it, it's essentially, if, if we understand that, then a, a machine that's running 27 megahertz would have to be, the audio frequencies would have to be all be recalibrated in order to actually be able to trigger some effective sidebands. And in some cases, the sidebands might be, might be possible, and in other cases, they might be too far from the, the highest power level uh, or radio frequency carrier to actually be effective. But, uh, so yeah, these all, all these instruments were different th from Philip Hoyland. And the, the square wave generators, um, as I said, they, they did start a whole new generation of, of different instruments, which, which, which is quite an important factor as well, because uh, these, these instruments are helping a lot of people. I've personally had a lot of, of help with uh, re recovery from sports injuries using audio frequencies directly with, with electrodes without a plasma tube. So, uh, so these were, these were, they weren't using ori the original design, but they still worked for certain things. And, and, and there's, there's some, important, some important research to be done, um, and this continues to be done with those audio frequencies. So, so why, why was Rife stopped, and how was he stopped? I, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of this material is covered in a lot of the documentaries and stuff, so I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go too much into it. But uh, Morris Fishbein was the editor of the Journal of American Medical Association in those days. And, uh, and I, I think I'm just going to skip through this. Uh, he, he may have colluded with Philip Hoyland. Well, I'll just leave it at that. And, and, uh, and so AM talk, AM talk Radio became really popular, made the FCC more popular or more, more powerful. And, uh, and the uh, evening talk radio was, was a, a popular thing and electrotherapy machines were interfering with this. So we had this factor of, of, of radio frequency interfering with AM talk radio. So the, the FCC uh, actually banned the use of electrotherapy machines between 7 p.m. and 11 p.m. in the 1930s. And, uh, and, and that, so Jeff Bihari from electrotherapy, Museum.com was uh, was the one that shared that that piece of information. So uh, so we we know Rife's uh, Rife's frequencies had issues that weren't related to just conspiracy issues or or anything like that. Um, so he was a scientist, not a businessman. I, I've mentioned this before. Hoyland's Hoyland was his his side was the business side, and so Hoyland figured out a way to. To, to protect 
the, uh, the, the propriety of the frequencies, but also to move it out of the AM broadcast band, because Rife's original frequencies were all in the AM, or mostly in the AM broadcast band. So Hoyland brought those, those frequencies up by increasing the carrier wave above three megahertz. And, and so we know this from the, clinic, the uh, spectrum analysis of, of the beam ray instrument. And so, so Hoyland, as I was explaining, Hoyland figured out a way of taking the original frequency. Here we have 400, 417,000 or 417 kilohertz was the original frequency that Reif would have used in the 1934 clinic and using that, that equipment or in the, in the Rife ray number, th number four. And so what Hoyland did was he figured out that he could multiply that up and, and hit the, the ninth higher harmonic of, of that frequency and hit this frequency of 3,753,000 and, and, and that is very obviously very close to a 3.8 megahertz carrier wave. So he still attained the, the power of this carrier wave because you can see the power level isn't, isn't much different uh, and, and you can't achieve that with a, with a simple square wave and using harmonics like was, was thought for many years was the, was the reason that, that audio frequency square waves were used. So, uh, so basically we have a, uh, we, we have a, uh, now a method here of, of hitting on those those original frequencies in a different way. And in these higher harmonics seem to work very well. So that, that was an important factor. So, so we have, we have a, a, this is a, a way that Philip Hoyland essentially hid this information and, and it turned into the, a, uh, a secret that no one knew how to figure out for about 72 years. Um, and now the spectrum analysis really shows shows what what was working, and so uh, you know we can look at at the historical documentation, the the lab notes, but there there are some inconsistencies on those lab note frequencies, and the reason is is that Reif was reading some of those frequencies and 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 writing them down on on his notes, but. As I explained, Reif was an optical engineer. He was not a, 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 an electro, electrical engineer, and that's why he paid Philip Hoyland to do this. So, so there were some, act, some misreading of those frequencies, and, and, and that's again covered in, in the report, which you can get at, at my table. Um, so I, I'll have to skip through this here. And, and so, and as I said, spectrum analyzers didn't, didn't exist back then, and so Philip Hoyland had to hide these frequencies. So, and, and the other thing is, as I said, no one would know which of these sidebands was actually working, um, but as long as it was a, a sideband that was close to the, the uh, main radio frequency carrier, it was, it was actually working. So, uh, and, and, and another thing, I, I mentioned that, that the audio frequency and the radio frequency were essential for this technology. The, the audio frequency originally in the, in the beam ray, or in the Rife Ray number four machine was, was, was actually a, a frequency that varied dep uh, depending on the, the instrument. In the, the 1934 clinic, for example, different audio frequencies were used with the same radio frequency that was, that was from Rife's notes. And, and those, so those, that audio frequency in that era didn't seem to matter as much because it wasn't using the sideband method of Philip Hoyland. But it, when, the, when the beam ray instrument came about and, and the later machines that were smaller compact machines, using a fixed radio frequency carrier in a specific range, then the audio frequency became a very important factor. And, and when a, a different audio frequency was used, it would produce a different cascade of sidebands and therefore not necessarily work to hit on the MOR that was, that was being targeted. So, so and, and this, here's another example. We have B or E. coli. 
uh, the audio frequency that's used is 7,833, 7, and, and this hits the, the, high, the higher harmonic, the ninth higher harmonic, uh, well, actually, I guess this is the same example, but this, is, this was the audio frequency that was used to, to trigger that, that MOR on the sixth sideband. So, and here's another example. 8,000 hertz was used to trigger the, uh, the third upper, upper sideband um, to, to get the, the eighth higher harmonic. So, so the audio frequencies, as I was explaining, determine the spacing between the sideband peaks. And, and, and so here's other examples, and, and you can see all these examples with all of the, all of the original organisms, microbes that, that Rife was using in, uh, in the, the full report. The bottom line is the math worked, and, and all, all of those MORs were triggered on one of the sidebands when, when we look at, at the, the, act, the accurate carrier frequency with a particular audio frequency. So, uh, so, so that's how we, we know this, was, this makes sense as, as, the, uh, as, as a way of, of hiding this technology because the math actually works. So, um, so that's, that's what I call the Rife code. Um, there's, as I said, there's many, many more examples, and 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 it it's, it it might hit a sideband below the carrier, and it might hit this, a sideband above the carrier, uh, but it's always a a higher harmonic of the original Rife frequency, which was in the AM, either in the AM or near the AM broadcast band. So, so Hoyland figured out how to encode these frequencies, uh, and, and he never revealed this for the entire beam ray depositions for the 1939 trial. So, and, and that's why future machines weren't functioning uh, in the same principle. So, so, and with the higher frequency, there wasn't as much of an FCC issue because there was, there was less interference with AM. There was, there was possibly some interference, but, but really less. And, and that's why uh, the, uh, these higher radio frequency carriers were used. And so, so again, here's, the, here's, the, the, here's the, the main radio frequency carrier. And then here is, oops, here is the, the spacing that was created by the single audio frequency that was running. So, so the audio frequency was just creating the spacing, which eventually hit on the right frequency on one of these peaks. And, and, and as I said, it, it might hit a higher, uh, a, an upper sideband, and it might hit a lower sideband. But it, it always had that mathematical relationship. And the operator never knew what, what was working. Spectrum analyzers weren't, weren't there. And, and each radio frequency carrier had a different, a, different, a different set of audio frequencies. And that's why we have two documented cases of that in, in two, two of the historical machines. So that's, uh, that's, that pretty much covers what I was, uh, was going to share for you. I want to thank you for, for being here. If anyone has any questions, you can see me out at my table, and uh, yeah, thank you. Ordinarily, we would take time to take questions and answers right now, except that we're running right on the minute, and we're going to start promptly at the next speaker right on time. It's exactly 10 minutes from now. So if you'd like to do a little bit of Q&A with Josh, um, you can join him out in the hallway here. Okay, so thank you very much. We'll see you all in 10 minutes.